Amen. Well, um, I talk to a lot of people during the week, as I'm sure you do too, and I sense, I don't know, just even more, so maybe I'm just more aware of it, but this week, so many people I talk to are going through very difficult times, and they just, do you ever have a day where you feel like you're fighting against an invisible wind? Mm -hmm. Well, so many people I talk to were going through that, and I was going through it as well, and it just, it was a tough week for so many different ways, and just the things going on in the world just just start, seem to weigh on you. And I, some days I get up in the morning and I think, if I gotta wear a mask one more day, I'm gonna punch somebody. I just, this is not normal. I want whatever normal is. Now, like Bobbitt says, normal is a setting on your dryer. That's the only thing in this world that's normal. But I just want back to what used to be normal and just, Things have changed and there's just an, there's an oppression, there's a weight, there's a heaviness on the whole country, on the whole world. And so my message today is overcoming oppression. Because I sensed oppression this week like I haven't in a long time. And I know in talking to a number of people, I'm not the only one. But to start out, the best way to always start out is consider Jesus. Now look at Jesus. Here's a man who happens to be God, the creator of everything. And he took time out of his busy schedule. You think you're busy? Trying to keep everything in existence running at one time. For those of you that are old enough to remember, remember they used to have on the Ed Sullivan show that guy with all the sticks and he had plates spinning on him and he had to keep running back and forth. Keep all. Can you imagine the plates that God has to keep spinning all day long, every day, 24 hours a day. And He knows everything. I get a headache just thinking about some of the things He might know. But look at Jesus. He came to earth and humbled Himself to become a man. And He lived in a world that was not perfect. And when you think of just even His conception, now, the way he was conceived, I was thinking about this the other day. If, if he would have chose a married woman to give birth to him, well, I don't know how to say this any more delicately than I can, especially on Mother's Day, you ladies are going to slap me. But if he would have chose a married woman, her womb has already born a child. And if he chose a woman that was not engaged at all, well then she would be looked at as a, a fornicator or an adulteress, or she would be looked at with great disdain. But he chose a woman who had never been with a man, but was engaged. So the worst that people thought of his mother was that, well, her and Joseph just couldn't wait. But still, they looked down their nose at him, but they said, well, okay, these young kids nowadays, they just couldn't wait any longer. But even his conception had controversy, had oppression, had opposition to it. And then when he was born, he wasn't born in Cedars of Sinai. He wasn't born in the Mayo Clinic. They had nowhere to give birth to this Savior of the world, so they had to have him born in a barn. And then when he was born, people decided, Herod especially, we got to kill this kid. So let's just kill everybody in the town of Bethlehem, two years old and younger. So as he's born, they want to kill him. As soon as he's born, they want to kill him. So they had to escape and go to Egypt. Well, Egypt is the, the hotbed of paganism. And they had to stay there until Herod died, and then they came back to Nazareth, where they were originally from, and he just grew up as a normal kid. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but I love that picture back there on the wall. Me and Bobbitt got that at Shipshuan a long time ago, and it's supposed to be Jesus as a little boy in, his, in Joseph's carpentry shop learning how to pound nails in. But look at where he had to learn a trade in a dirt poor town, totally under the oppression of the Roman government. And just think the things that Jesus saw. 
And then I love the scripture in, in Acts chapter 10 that talks about Jesus. It says, Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Ghost and power. And you're going, wow, what a, what a precursor. Filled with the Holy Ghost and power, what did he do? He went about doing good. That's, that's what he did. That's all Jesus ever did. He came here because he loved us so much he wanted to show us how to live the right way, how to get along with each other, how to obey the invisible God, and then to die and be the sacrifice to pay the, the price for all of our sins. And of course, look at how his life ended. So if anybody knows oppression, it's Jesus. He was the most oppressed human being that's ever lived on this earth. Now before we go any further, I want to give you Webster's definition of a few words here. The word oppression means unjust or cruel exercise of authority or power, a sense of being weighed down in body or mind. And then the word opposition means an act of setting opposite or over against, a body of persons opposing something. And then the word opponent one that takes an opposite position as in a debate, contest, or a conflict. Jesus faced this, his whole ministry, for three and a half years, when all he's trying to do is just be a nice guy and help people. He faced nothing but opposition and oppression, and his opponents were none other than his own people. And not only just the people, the common people received him gladly, but the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they hated him. On Wednesday nights we were talking about how they plot in secret to kill him. Not just make him look bad, not just send him back to Nazareth, but to kill him. And he faced that. Well, Jesus said, a servant's not greater than his master. If they hate me, they'll hate you. Right. So it's not uncommon that we would sense oppression and opposition and feel like we have opponents. You know, sometimes in life you just feel like you're just, everywhere you turn, somebody's against you. You can't do right for it by anybody. You know, people love to criticize, but they sure don't like to help. And they're just like, I need some help here. But Jesus overcame. Now, in looking at oppression, this opposition, where does it come from? It comes from one of three places. First of all, the world. In 1 John 2.16 it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. We live in a carnal world. Carnal means the five senses, which you hear, see, smell, taste, and feel. And all that's in this world that we have to interact with. Now remember, the word lust means to desire something that doesn't belong to you. The children of Israel lusted after leeks and onions. I've been hungry before. I never lusted over an onion. But they were so hungry, they least lusted after leeks and onions. But the lust of the flesh, there's things that our flesh wants. It says, I want that. I want a house like that. I want a car like that. I want a woman like that or a spouse like that. I want a vacation home like this. I want jewelry like this. I want to be able to eat in those kind of restaurants. I, 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 I. And that lust, the things that our bodies want, causes turmoil, causes a struggle within us. And the lust of the eyes, the things that we see, oh, man, I would be so happy if I had one of those and the pride of life. You know, the Apostle Paul said, I've learned how to be exalted and I've learned how to be abased. But I've also learned in whatever state I'm in therewith to be content. You know, the other day I came home from work and I pulled in my driveway and put the car in the garage and I looked in the window and I saw Bobbitt in there and, and I thought, you know what? I like my life. I like my wife. I like the house I live in. I'm content. I don't know if Bob can say the same about me, but I'm content. 
But you know what? You can't be content in this world because there's a lot of different oppositions like Madison Avenue, like Wall Street. Because if you're content, you're not going to go buy anything. So there's this, there's, if you notice, every company now, they have marketing experts. We have one at work. And you know what they do? They dream up ideas to make you uncontent. You're not going to be happy unless you have this. You're not going to be successful unless you live here. You're not going to be sexy unless you drive this kind of car. I mean, they hire all these Hollywood movie stars to drive certain cars, and you go, oh, wow, I wish I could have that. Because you can't be content. You know why? Because if you're content, you'll keep your hard-earned money in your pocket. And they got to figure out a way to get your money out of your pocket and put it in theirs. So they make you uncontent. Oh, you're not successful. You live in this little house? Well, look at this house, lifestyle of the rich and famous. In the world, and the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes, and the lust of all kinds of things, it makes us unsatisfied. It says it's of the world, which means it's not of God. And this can cause turmoil. It can, and as you're trying to get these things, you face oppression and opposition and opponents. And, you know, I, I think I told you a few weeks ago, we went to a, a good friend of mine, his church, and it's a big mega church, and they're doing great things, and I, I love them, and I'm so proud of them, and I'm happy for them. But on the way home, I told Bob, you know what, I'm glad I'm the pastor of the church I am. I don't want to be a pastor of a mega church. I like where I'm at. I like our church. I like you. And I'm content. But the world says, oh, you're not successful. You've got to be bigger, better, greater, stronger, taller, skinnier, richer. You, you just can't be satisfied. And it causes oppression. And this weight comes on you and this heaviness. Oh, look at how handsome her husband is. Look at how beautiful his wife is. Look at how successful their kids are. Look at the car they drive. What's the matter with you? Look at how big his church is. He's got a TV ministry. You're not successful. God's not happy with you. Just one thing after another, and it will make you crazy. And all this oppression. So one form comes from the things of this world. The other source of oppression is, everybody go like this, and then go like this. <laughs> me. Well, what do you mean, me? <clears throat> the Apostle Paul said in Romans 7, 21-23, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Someday you're going to say, would you stop saying that, Pastor Dave? We heard it enough times, but i got to say it again. Yeah. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you right. live in a body. Yes. You're a triune being created in the image of God. Uh -huh. Hero Israel, Dave is one. There's only one of me. But I'm a soul, a spirit, and a body. That's right. Hero Israel, the Lord thy God is one, but he's a father, son, and the Holy Ghost. We're created in his image. Now, what Paul is saying here, my inward man wants to obey the laws of God. But my outward man has different desires. It wants to go its own way. That's right. That's right. If I just did what my body wanted to do, you know what I'd do? I'd sleep in until about 11 o'clock right. every day. And I'd sit in my recliner and watch bozo cartoons and eat <laughs> chocolate chip cookies all day long. Mm -hmm. That's what my body wants to do. That's right. But I can't listen to what my body says. That's right. So there's a law, there's a struggle, there's a fight within us. And you know who your greatest opponent is sometimes? You. Because we're stuck in this battle. Now there's a war going on in the heavenlies. There's a war going on out there in the world. But you know what? There's a war going on in here for right. each one of us. Yes. 
Every day, like Paul said, I die daily. What did he mean by that? He gets buried in the ground, he has to dig himself out every night? No. He says, I tell my body. See, my spirit is supposed to tell my mind, my heart, what to do, and then it tells my body what to do. But when I let my body tell my spirit and my mind what I'm going to do, everything gets all out of whack. That's right. So I have to say, what Paul is saying is, I tell my body, I don't care what you want to do. Do you think Paul wanted to walk, I don't know, 50, 60, 100 miles to the next town and get hated and get rocks thrown at him and maybe get beat? and get thrown in prison? Do you think he was saying, oh, goody, goody, my body can't wait to get another couple, 30, 40, what lashes? But his spirit says you have to follow what God wants you to do. And fortunately, none of us have to get up and take 30 to 40 lashes. But we got to get up and go to work. Or we got to go to our neighbors and tell them, you know, hey, can I help you do something? Or can I bring you some chocolate chip cookies? And how are you doing? Oh, by the way, I'll pray for you. Whatever God's telling us to do that makes us leave our comfort zone, yes. we die daily. But I wish I could tell you that if you get to a certain spiritual level, then you don't have that opposition anymore. But the only time that opposition is going to leave is when we leave this body of sin behind and get our glorified body. So one source of opposition is the world. The other source of opposition is us. But then, of course, the other source of opposition is none other than the devil. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now God, capital G, capital O, capital D, refers to the devil as small g, small o, small d, but he does have authority here because Adam and Eve gave it to him. Yes. Now Jesus has destroyed the devil, but Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, this world system, but he's coming back someday and he is going to take control of things. But in the meantime, the world is run by a drunken landlord yeah. and he's insane. And he wants to drive this world right into hell. Mm -hmm. And he blinds people's minds. And he'll do anything he can to try to hinder us. And he causes all kinds of opposition. Now if you want to know some of the little tricks that are up his sleeve, all you got to do is look at the temptation of Adam and Eve. First of all, the Bible says the serpent was more crafty than any other animal, any other creature. And he's crafty. When you think of crafty, well, you could think of, yeah, they knit together sweaters and they make baskets, that kind of crafty. But that's not what he's talking about here. Crafty meaning conniving, sneaking. If somebody says, you're crafty, they're not, you know, complimenting you on, on the knickknacks you made. They're saying, you're, you're sneaking. I don't know if I can trust you. Are you going to put a knife in my back? Well, that's what he is. He's crafty. He'll come at you from every angle, from above, from below, from within, from without, anything he can. And he pretends to be our ally. Oh, how you doing? Come on, let me, let me help you out here. And then he bends the truth of God's Word. Amen. All he wants to do is pervert God's Word. That's right. And he'll twist it. And he, look at what he did with Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God. The Word became flesh. And He tempted the Word of God with the Word of God. Now is that crafty or what? First of all, that's a lot of chutzpah. <laughs> to go up to the Creator of the universe who created you and then say, and try to trick Him with the Word of God. And He is the Word of God. <laughs> so if he'll, if he'll try to twist the Word of God to Jesus, you know He's going to try to twist the Word of God with us. He tries to plant doubts in your mind about the things that God has said. What's the first recorded words of Satan? Half God said. And he'll whisper to us, you're going through a hard time, and he says, you're not going to make it. There's no hope. 
there, I was given some very, very, very bad news this week, about the worst bad news I could get. And the devil's just trying to convince me, yep, there's no hope. That word today, I needed that. Nothing is impossible with God. But He'll come and He'll try to steal your hope, steal your joy, steal your anticipation. And He'll just come and He'll just make you doubt everything God, every promise God ever gave you. Especially because when you're, when you're, you're waiting and you're, you're striving for somebody else, God says, they're never going to come around. There's no hope for them. Just give up. He encourages us to rebel against God, saying, after all, you're your own person. You have a right to do whatever you want. And how many people fall for that? And then what he likes to do is he says, you know what? God doesn't want you to do this thing or not do this thing or whatever the temptation may be because He just wants to steal your joy. And He just wants to keep you under His thumb. And He's a killjoy. When everything, every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness or um, chance of changing. And, and God is good. And everything He has in store for us is good. But He'll try to twist it and say, yeah, but I want to do this. And they're doing it. And he's doing it. And she's doing it. And they're getting away. Why can't I do it? God only wants what's best for us. And if He puts a governor, let the peace of God rule your heart. That word rule in the Greek means to govern. He puts a governor on us. If we want to go a certain way or do a certain thing, and He says, no, don't do that. You say, yeah, but I want to. And other people are doing it. And they're okay. Well, but God wants only what's best for us. That's right. Amen. So what do we do with this character, this devil guy? Well, James 4, 7 tells us, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. That's what you do with him. And he will flee from you. Because you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. Remember those cartoons when we were little kids? There'd be a little devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other, and they're whispering in your ear. And you're just stuck in the middle of one. Decide which one you're going to listen to. Am I going to follow my spirit, or am I going to follow my flesh? Which one am I going to do? Don't even play the game. Don't even let him start whispering in your ear. Resist the devil. Now, if you resist him on your own, good luck. Because he's crafty. He's smarter than you. He's stronger than you. He will beat you every time in the game of chess and have you checkmated in three moves. But it says, first of all, submit to God. Amen. And that word submit in the Greek means to make like wax. That's right. Like wax in somebody's hand. Just say, okay, Lord, here I am. Do whatever you want with me. Send me wherever you want. Do whatever. I'm just, I'm yours. And He will mold you into what He wants to. Then you have the authority. Then you have the clout, the power to say, I resist you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. And it says, He will flee. Amen. Now that word flee in our mind makes us think of somebody turn around and run as fast as you can. But that word flee in the Greek means to run in abject terror. He is scared to death of us. Because the last thing He wants us to realize is the authority. Jesus said, all authority has been given unto Me. So do you think Jesus was ever afraid of the devil? And then He says, and all authority I give to you. So how much authority did Jesus have? All authority. And how much did He give to us? All the authority He has. We don't know that. We can't grasp it. The devil knows it, but he sure doesn't want you to know that. So, if you submit yourself, then resist. Say, you know what, I'm not even going to listen to you. I'm not even going to play this game. Just shut up and get out of here. I resist you in the name of Jesus. He says, uh-oh. This person has realized what authority and power they have. And he runs like a little schoolgirl with his tail between his legs, scared to death for his life. Like the old saying, when the devil reminds you of your past, you just remind him of his future. You know the old saying, there's nothing more powerful 
than the weakest saint on their knees. What Jesus did to overcome this oppression, because Jesus was the most oppressed person in existence, first of all, in Luke 5.16 it says, and he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. When you're feeling like you're being oppressed, and you're just coming in on all sides, and you can't see any way out, just take a break, step out of it. Just go away from everything. You know, we got so many things coming at us. I mean, our cell phone's screaming at us 10,000 times a day in 10,000 different ways. I mean, I look at people on their phones, they brush their teeth on their phone if they can figure out a way to do it. I mean, they just do everything on there. They have it with them everywhere. Where's my phone? Where's my phone? And then you got your computer, you got your laptop, you got your iPads, you got your television, you got your cable, you got your fire stick, you got your radios, you got your earbuds, you got thousands of things coming at you and they all got their own opinion they're always trying to sway you one way or the other and then they have these things I don't know if you've ever heard of them they're called commercials and they're telling you you're not happy you got to get one of these oh does it hurt when you go like this well give me 1995 and it won't hurt when you go like this anymore. I mean they got a fix for everything and when you when you just water it all down it's take my money out of my pocket that I worked for and give it to them for some promise the whole world's selling snake oil you know what I like what I got and I'm 67 years old it's gonna hurt when I go like this the devil wants to just make us unhappy. He wants all this pressure and all these voices. And so, so what Jesus would do, he would just get away. Could you imagine the oppression, the pressure that, that Jesus had on him? Multitudes would walk for days because they heard Jesus was going to be in town. And they'd go there and they'd say, solve all my problems. And he healed them all. He delivered people of, of the devils. I don't know if you've ever been involved in uh, um, an exorcism. It takes a lot out of you. And Jesus has cast the devil out of this person, heal this person's blindness, heal that guy from can't hear it, cast out a few more devils, and he just did that. And then everywhere he went, they said, oh, great master, what are you going to teach us? And then when he fed 5,000, it was like, Wow, not only do we get all this other stuff, but we get a free meal too. So when are you going to make it rain bread again? We like that. That was good fish. Everywhere he went. Talk about demands. So he just said, you know what? I'm taking a break. And he would just go away. And he didn't just sit there and say, I'm going to relax and play a video game. No, he prayed. And what does that mean, pray? He said, oh, heavenliest fathers, I beseech you thee on the graces. He just poured his heart out. Yes, Father, it. it's hard down here. We looked up there, down here, and we saw what these people had to go through. But man, I'm right smack dab in the middle of it, and it's tough down here. And these people are so needy. They're like sheep that have no shepherd. And the goat herder, the devil's driving them in every different direction, and he would pray. And many times it said angels would come and minister to him. So we can do that. Sometimes you need to just get away. Remember the old TV commercial when the ladies had Kelgon, take me away. We all need a Kelgon moment. But I'm not going to take a bubble bath, so I just... <laughs> my Kelgon moment is downstairs I have a chair and I'm all by myself. And I put on my prayer shawl and I go down there and I'm just locked away from the world. It's just me and Jesus. And I just go away. Mm -hmm. Oh, I step out of all my problems and I just say, they're yours. And I just, me and Jesus. But then, sometimes, you got to do more than that. In Mark 9.29 it says, And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Sometimes just prayer alone won't overcome the oppression or the deliverance or the, the strength or whatever you need. you got to add fasting to it. Well, who wants to do that? That ain't no fun. But, you know, fasting can mean a lot of different things. 
I'll just tell you the story real quick because it's so applicable, but you've, a lot of you have heard this before. When I went to this one big church once and I was a brand new Christian, and the pastor said, I'm um, um, Good Friday. We're all going to fast until Sunday. And then we're going to get together and we're going to rejoice. So I thought, okay, well, we're going to fast. Now, when I used to be a Hindu, I used to fast all the time. But I would do total fasts. I would just drink water, but only a little bit. So I thought, well, I'm a Christian. How much more can I fast for God? So I didn't eat nothing. And then Saturday night, it usually takes three days before your stomach stops sending messages to your brain that says, hey, stupid, we need food down here. <laughs> and it was only Saturday, and I was hungry. And I got up, and I ate a cheese sandwich. And I went to church on Sunday so depressed. I thought the pastor was going to point me out in front of everybody and say, this guy ate something. But then I get there and he says in front of the whole church, he says, well, we all fasted. He says, I feel so, so much alive to, to um, serve the Lord and praise God in this resurrection day. He says, I fasted television for three days. And I go, wait a minute. You mean you get to pick what you're going to fast? Nobody told me that. <laughs> I believe what the principle here is you know we're so wrapped up with food every night me and Bobette we play this game I come home from work and after a certain time we look at each other and say what do you want for dinner I don't know what do you want for dinner and they say okay well we've said that so now what are we going to do for dinner I don't know just take that out of your mind you know what have a cup of tea or if you can't do a complete fast, have some juice or have a bowl of soup. But just take the whole food thing and all this, this normal ritual stuff out of your life and just be away with God and pray and pour your heart out because that will break the suppression and put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Start praising God in your prayer and worshiping Him. And when God, when you praise Him, He shows up. And that heaviness goes out the window. The Holy Spirit has a part to play in all this. In John 20, verse 21 through 22, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now there's different things that the Holy Ghost does in our lives. He convicts us, He draws us, He adopts us, He seals us, He baptizes us, He refills us. But there's sometimes when we just need the Holy Ghost to breathe on us. Amen. And when you're, when you're alone with God and you're just saying, Lord, I need this encouragement, I need something. And He can breathe on you. And the Holy Spirit is the same Spirit that rose Christ Jesus from the dead. The same, there's not like 27 different Holy Spirits that are doing all these things. There's one Spirit of God. Remember what Jesus told the woman at the well? God is a Spirit. And those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. There's only one Spirit. And the same Spirit that took Jesus' dead body in that tomb and brought it back to life is the same Spirit that lives inside me and you. Amen. Same exact one. Now, another thing we can do, and this may surprise you, this will be my last point, is you can pray with other believers. In James chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Well, let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Amen. Sometimes, that's why it's important to get together. That, you know, God didn't just say, forsake not the gathering together of yourselves as the manner of some is, but even more so as you see that day approach. He didn't just say that 
just because he wants churches full so he can get more money in the offering. God don't need your money. He says that because we're part of the body of Christ. And I never wake up in the morning and my right hand says to my left hand, stay in bed today, I don't need you. I need every part of my body. And we are part of the body of Christ and we need one another. It's good for us to get together. But there's something that we can do. We can pray for one another. We're going to do that in a moment. But the other thing we can do is it says confess your faults one to another. Now I'm just going to warn you. I wish this wasn't so. But I've been in the church for 45 years and I've learned a thing or two. If you're being tempted, or you're being oppressed, or you're being discouraged, or you're being attacked, or anything you're going under, if you go to somebody and say, oh, please help me, I'm being tempted to kick my dog, or I'm being tempted to rob my neighbor, or please help me because I think I'm going to go jump off a bridge, or whatever you say, some people, what they'll do, they say, oh, I'll pray for you, sister. I'll pray for you, brother. And then they get on the phone and they start the prayer chain. Oh, we got to pray for Sister McGillicuddy because she's tempted to rob the, the local store and then jump off a bridge. So we got to pray for her. And it, it's, it's supposed to be a prayer request, but it becomes a gossip chain. Right. And then you come to church and everybody looks at Mrs. McGillicuddy. You got to use discernment. Right. What you got to do is you got to find a friend in the church. Amen. And you know how you find a friend in the church? Yes. Be friendly. Do you want to be a friend with someone that's not friendly? Well, neither does anyone else. So be friendly to somebody. And then find a friend. Somebody you can trust. And then you know what happens? When you go up to somebody and you say, can I ask you that you, you've, you've got a relationship and you feel like you can trust that person. And you say, you know what, I'm really going through a hard time. And you think they're going to say, oh, I can't believe it. You no good, terrible, lousy sinner. Because that's what the devil says. The devil says, you're the only one going through this. Nobody else ever feels this way. You know what, you're a terrible Christian. Look at all these other people in church. They're perfect. They smile and they look so nice. They don't have any problems in their life. And then you just start to feel more and more depressed, more and more alone. But when you find a friend, and you bury your soul, and you say, you know what I'm going through? And they say, you know what? So am I. Or they say, I went through that last year, and you know what the Lord showed me to overcome that? First of all, you destroy that lie of the devil that you're the only one. Let me tell you something. I've been a pastor for almost 30 years, and I've heard a lot of different things. And it's, if it wasn't so serious and sad, it'd almost be comical when people say, Pastor, I've got to tell you something. And they think they're going to tell me something I haven't heard. There's only so many sins people can do, and I think I've heard them all. And I've heard some doozies, I'll tell you. We're all sinners. We're all in the same boat. So when the devil says, oh, you're the only one, find somebody and just share that with them. And then... If two sets a thousand to flight, or if one sets a thousand to flight, two shall set ten thousand to flight. There's strength. If any two or three of you shall agree as touching anything on earth, it shall be done by my Father which is in heaven. There's a power point of agreement. And you pray with somebody and they say, you know, I went through that last year and this is what the Lord showed me. And you, you give them the scripture that saw you through. And... It says you can be healed. The word save and the word healed are the same Greek word, and it's the word sozo. And it means to be made whole, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And sometimes to overcome oppression and loneliness and just heaviness is to just call a brother or sister on the phone or grab them after church and say, hey, you know what I'm going through? And that will help. Now, I just want to share three scriptures with you real quick, and then I'm done. Three things to remember. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 3-4. through four. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God 
to the pulling down of strongholds. Amen. You can't give the devil a black eye as much as I would love to. You can't, because he's a spirit, and I can't. I can't get my hands on him. If I could, he'd probably beat the snot out of me because he's more powerful than I am. But you can't fight these spirits of oppression and depression and all these other things that come against us, the lies and all the, the hurts, you can't, you can't fight them in the flesh. But the weapons that God gives us, they're mighty and they're through Him. There's the fruit of the Spirit, there's the gifts of the Spirit. And those will conquer anything and pull down strongholds. In Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. You are the righteousness of God. You know, the only reason you and I are righteous is because Jesus gave us His righteousness. I gave Him my sin, He gave me His righteousness. And it says right here, our righteousness is of Him. So you can't, well, I don't know if you're as righteous as so-and-so. You know, so. It doesn't matter. I'm as righteous as Jesus. Because I have the righteousness of Jesus. That's the only thing that makes me righteous. Amen. Nothing I could ever say or do. I could give my body to be burned, give all my money to the poor, and nothing is going to make me righteous. And because of that, I'm a servant of the Lord. Are you a servant of the Lord? Amen. Well, this is your heritage. You know what your heritage is? Not a single weapon that's formed against you can prosper. Now the devil's going to come and huff and puff and try to blow your house down and say, oh, God's forgotten you. You're never going to make it through. If I was you, I'd just go jump off a bridge, give up and quit and die. There's no hope. That's a lie. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason that he says there's no weapons formed against us that are going to prosper, because you know why? There's a lot of weapons that are formed against us. That's right. As soon as you give your life to Jesus, you've got a gigantic target on your back. Amen. As soon as you're born on the planet Earth, there's a target on your back because the devil hates us because we're created in the image of God. But when you give your life to Jesus, that target gets a lot bigger. And the more you do for Him, the bigger the target. And anyone that rises in judgment against us, that raises their tongue against us, God's going to condemn. I know for a fact I hope you don't have this experience, but I know for a fact there are people out there that don't like me. And if you said David Michael, they would start, their tongues would start wagging with the things they don't like about me. Some people even hate me. Now, I'm not perfect, and I've never done everything perfect, but I've never done anything purposely to hurt anyone. But I know there's people that hate me, and it used to bother me a lot. So one day the Lord says you can't drive a parked car and you can't drive forward always looking in the rear view mirror. And the Apostle Paul said, putting all things behind me, I press forward to the mark of a high calling in Christ Jesus. So when these people say things about me, and I know there are some people that do, I just got to say, Lord, I put it in your hands. I pray for them. I love them. And I just pray, Lord, that someday we could reconcile. If not, don't, anything that they say against me, don't hold it to their account. And you may have dealt with people, even family members, even friends, yeah. who knows? And you just say, Lord, I put them in your hands because God says the tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, He's going to condemn. they got to deal with it, not me. And then finally, if I said nothing else all day, this would be worth it. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. You know, you hear me say all the time, if it's important to you, it's important to God. This is why I say that. He says casting. When I see that, when, has anybody here ever gone fishing? What do you do? You cast, right? How do you cast? You just go... 
No, you throw it. You cast it. And what God is telling us is all the things that you're worried about, that you're anxious about, that you're fearful about, take them and throw them at Jesus. Well, what did Jesus ever do? Nothing, but He's telling me to throw them at Him. Cast them on Him. And how many of those cares? All of them. Yeah, but this, you know, I, I think it's funny when people ask me, you know, Pastor Dave, will you pray for my dog or my kitty? I know it's not important. Is it important to you? Then it's just as important to God that I pray for my sister. It's important. If it's important to you, it's important to Him. You take whatever is important and you just throw it with all your might on Jesus. All of it. Every little thing you can imagine that's, that's troubling you, that's weighing you down. And you put them on Him. Yes. Because He's got big shoulders. Amen. And He said, Come unto Me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, Amen. and I'll give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn of Me, for I'm meek and lowly of heart. And, and as you know, the yoke is this long board that's made for two animals. And Jesus is just standing there with that yoke on, and He's looking at you. And this side's empty. He says, are you tired of carrying all that worry by yourself? How are you doing with that? Yeah, but what if this happens? And what if they said? And what about that? And, and you just wave. You just keep going down and down. Your knees are buckling. And He says, are you done doing it on your own? Well, then just throw it all away and climb in here and get on the other side of that yoke with me. And when you yoke two animals, it cuts the workload in half. But here's the good point. If an animal's having a bad day, the other animal carries all the weight. But you know what? The person I'm yoked up with, Jesus, He never has a bad day. Right. I have almost every day is a bad day for me. <laughs> he got the bad end of the deal. But He's saying, come on, get in this yoke with me. Come on, quit worrying about it. Yeah, but this is my loved one. This is my job. This is my livelihood. I'm, this is important. He said, I know it's important. That's why you should throw it on me and just get in the yoke with me. Amen. Cast it on me. Why? Why is He saying all this? For no other reason than this, because He careth for you. Amen. Whatever is important to you, you are a hundred times more important to Him. So, I'm going to leave you with a question. Just imagine if you didn't have to worry anymore. You know what we we come up in our minds the way we could get to that place in life where I don't have to worry anymore is, man, if I won the lottery, if I had enough money, I'd never have to worry again. All my bills would be paid. If anything broke down, I could afford to get it paid. I could go wherever. I wouldn't have to worry anymore. Well. Talk to somebody who had more money than anyone in the world. His name was Solomon. And he said, a poor man never goes to sleep at night afraid that someone's going to kidnap his children and hold them for ransom. Do you ever notice wealthy people? They always live in big houses, but they have walls around those houses. And they have armed guards. And when they go out in public, they have to have a bodyguard. I don't need a bodyguard. Wherever I go, I got Bobette. She can beat up anybody. <laughs> She'll probably beat me up later for saying that. Right? <laughs> I love you, Bobette. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> but we always come up with our own ideas of how we could get to a position in life where I wouldn't have to worry anymore. But you know what? You're already in that position in life yes. because you know Jesus. Amen. Jesus is telling us you don't have to worry anymore. Yeah, but what about this? And what about what about it? Yes. What about it? You, whatever is important to you, is important to Him. Just climb in that yoke with Him wherever He leads you. Just say, "Okay, I'm going," and make yourself like wax in His hand. Amen. Wherever He leads you, say, I don't like it here, Lord, but this, for some reason, this is where you want me to be. Yes. So I'm going to just submit to you. And when the Amen. devil comes, just say, I resist you in the name of Jesus. Amen. And the devil sees some guy or some woman yoked up with Jesus. And man, he's going to run like a little schoolgirl with his tail between his legs, crying like a baby, trying to find some rock to hide behind, trying to find someone else who doesn't know who they are. 
right. and beat up on them for a while. Oppression and heaviness and the worries and the cares of this life weigh down on all of us. Right. Job says, as surely as sparks fly upward, man is born to trouble. It's the way it is. But the good news is, we don't have to worry about it. I've read the end of the book. We win. And the journey from the womb to the tomb, as long as I'm walking with Jesus, I'm going to be okay. It won't be boring, that's for sure. It'll be interesting. But He's going to take care of me.